we're really excited to announce the release of this study con uh, conducted in collaboration with the 4A's Media Measurement Task Force. If you guys want to start coming up to the stage, that'd be great. Um, we call this the ROI Attribution Providers, a comparison of leading providers of media performance analytics, and it's in everyone's packet. And so, you know, we've been hearing here how important ROI measurement is in the industry, and it's, uh, I'm happy to bring to the stage Jim Spaeth and Alice Sylvester, who are making a business out of demystifying media mix modeling and attribution. They'll introduce the guide, and then they'll moderate a panel to discuss the issues. So come on up. Here's your clicker right here, Alice. Thank you. You know, I feel like I have to watch a rerun of that last panel. It's like, whoa, wait, what, what? <laughs> um, are the videos available? Yeah, I'm going to watch it again. Um, we have a simpler topic. It's about attribution providers. Um, what I want to talk to you about is this report that Jim and I did uh, on behalf of SIM and the 4As that takes a look at who's doing what. This is not a report on are they doing it right? or you know, where do they get that idea? This is a report on who literally is doing what. And we took our, our model from Jane's cross-platform provider comparison, which is a tidy little sheet, a one-pager that has Nielsen and Comscore, and at the time it was Symphony Advanced Media. Right at the top, three columns and about 10 rows, right? Perfect. Well, that doesn't work when you've got 19 columns in 35 rows. It does not turn into a snappy little grid. Trust me, I tried. I spent the summer trying to figure that out. <laughs> so what we have for you is, is a beautiful guide. It's going to be on the website. It's great. And we did it because this is a really confusing field right now. There's a lot of stuff going on. It's evolving. It's really fast paced. And we're wrestling with this range of analytic providers. Like, what do they do? Who are they? Those kinds of questions are asked all the time. All the different data sources, how are they putting them together? Um, and what statistics are they using? Um, of course, the next step is, does any of this make any sense? But that is not exactly the purpose of this document. The purpose of the document is to have the, the, the buyers of attribution services say, uh, does this make any sense? What is your solution here? To facilitate a dialogue all the way around. Here's what it looks like. Dun, da, da, da. Um, so we worked with a committee of people that guided us. And, and part of this is CYA, because if it were up to Jim and I, I'm not sure our professional liability insurance is, is up <laughs> high enough. Um, but so the committees helped identify the providers that we should zero in on, as well as the, some of the key variables. Um, it was a very comprehensive information gathering process. And uh, again, in you know, classic CYA, we shared the results of each provider's profile with them on two separate occasions and let them fine tune this. And then we looked at their answers and made sure that we weren't being, you know, um, you know that there was no smoke involved in this. And then we uh, developed this, this lovely guide. So these are the providers we group them. I already know that people will object to their location and the, the, the group that they provided. But we have market mix modelers who are in the attribution space. We have uh, attribution specialists with cross-platform offerings. We have straight up digital or television attribution providers. And then we have what we call single source providers. So um, of course, there's a lot of wiggle room in each one of these groupings. But this is, a, I think, the way that people think about these uh, providers. There are 23 providers that we ended up with. And they're grouped color-coded uh, in this guide. Um, the kinds of things you'll find in the guide is, um, you know, how do they position themselves? What do they say they do? Um, you know, what, how do they approach it? And, and I'm telling you, this is really hard. So um, what kind of KPIs can they deliver? And you'll see that we have a really nice little way of, of, of comparing people on the offerings that they're doing, all the way through to um, model validation, uh, collinearity. Uh, you know, we feel pretty strongly that as we move into attribution, we can't forget what we know about advertising and 
how advertising works. We cannot go backwards. So if, a, if an attribution model doesn't include a baseline or other kind of um, marketing effects, it's, it's taken us backwards and not forwards. So we have those kinds of variables in this deck. And then how does the data get delivered and what kind of applications are they uh, leaning in on? Uh, in, in this document, um, so we, there's so much education required today in the industry um, that we had to put a page together in front of each one of these groupings to say, what's going on? What do you need to think about? What issues are there? What will you see in this document? So we had an essay on each one of these sections included in this, uh, in the, the deliverable. So here's Analytic Partners. This is a, one of the market mix modelers with an attribution. And you'll see the way it's laid out. It originally, remember, it was supposed to be on a single piece of paper with every provider lined up uh, you know, horizontally. And it just didn't work that way. So it still has that brevity. It has that tightness of, uh, you know, and, and hopefully clarity around some of these ideas. All the variables for all the providers are exactly the same, page after page after page. And then how they weigh in against it is what makes the difference between these providers. Um, analytic Partners has a lot of dots, um, but not everybody has as many uh, filled in uh, offerings and as a complete uh, offering as Analytic Partners does. This is the page. Look, we have an attribution uh, specialist with cross-platform products. There's so much blending now between attribution and market mix modelers or between television and, and uh, digital attribution specialists that we had to address this as a separate group. Uh, here's Conversion Logic, which is an example of one of the companies that are uh, an attribution specialist that work in across media, mostly television and digital. Um, and then, you know, the, the straight up digital uh, attribution providers or the television attribution providers, you know, what are they doing these days? Um, and it's important to look at them. It's important to see what they have to offer as well. Here's iSpot that does television attribution. I guess television and digital attribution. Um, and you'll see, uh, we, didn't, we didn't change the variables on this because the whole purpose of this is to be able to say, um, you know, I, I want to look at who provides things like this. Um, single source providers, and this is Nielsen Catalina as an example of those kinds of things. Um, as we got into this, we realized that we are leaning pretty heavily on our own understanding of terms, and that that's not going to help the industry if we just continue perpetuating the exact same language and not explaining it or not providing any kind of guidance on it. So the last three pages are an amazing deliverable in and of themselves, which is a three-page glossary of key terms that you're going to find throughout this document. There's a little bit of editorializing in there. We identify this as, you know, it's based on Wikipedia because that's what people will go to when they're looking to define a topic. But then we edited and, and made it totally relevant to uh, the task at hand. We're really proud of this glossary. Um, it was as hard as the whole project. Uh, have I told you how hard this project was? But, um, <laughs> but the interesting thing about it is that we got the cooperation of the providers. They're all getting a copy of this final version today, sort of uh, as, as we speak. And um, we couldn't have done it without their cooperation. And I know that it's in their best interest to look as good as they can in a comparative document like this. But we went way out of our way to make sure that we weren't being smoked and that this was actually the, this was actually the offering and the understanding of the terms that we were using. So it's our hope that this um, provides a lot of, uh, of insight for people and really does help people understand the space and, uh, and begin asking questions about the providers. So there you have it. Thanks very much. Jim. OK, thank you, Alice. So let me introduce the panel. Um, to my right is Alice Sylvester, <laughs> so we'll get her to talk some more. Uh, David Ernst from A&E, Luke and Clark from AIG, and Claire Brown from RPA. Wow. We don't have initials. Don't <laughs> <laughs> so um, Alice, uh, panel, a Alice shared with us a little peek at the guide, and you got one in your kit. You may have leafed through it and circled things and underlined things and highlighted things in four different colors and stuff like that. What motivated this report actually is, and Jane alluded to this, the report we did <clears throat> excuse me, last year for SIM was the landscape. And after looking at the landscape, we said, holy crap, it's confusing. Um, that actually, it's a quote, holy crap, it's confusing. Um, and, we, and in discussion, it became clear that we needed some way to navigate this, because there's so many different people calling what they do attribution or linking what they do to attribution 
and um, it just seemed like such a challenge. So the, the motivation is that attribution appears to be growing in importance. We, we hear about it all the time. We don't talk to a brand. I mean, we heard in the previous panels mentioned at least seven or eight times, sometimes positive, sometimes negative. Um, but do, do you agree that, that we're seeing this sort of surge in interest in application in, in attribution? So maybe ladies first. I'll, I'll start and tell you a story that I, I told on our prep call, which was that two weeks ago the four A's <coughs> called me and asked me if I could give them any material about attribution for the benefit of a meeting they were about to have with their smallest clients, a group of their smallest local agency clients. And the agencies, these are all local agencies who have local clients, single market clients, who had requested an education and a briefing from the 4As about attribution. So I don't know how many of those agencies and clients are actually going to end up doing attribution projects, but they're asking. So that this, this topic is of interest right in front of marketers of all sizes right now. So I think it is. So, so I work in a data science and optimization team. and. One of the questions we frequently get from leadership is what works, which is a single scariest question that is asked of all of our marketers. Two, three years ago when I started this, maybe it was 10% of our portfolio. It's pretty much all I'm asked right now, especially coming into our 2018 work program. And so we all get in a room, everyone's happy, and then leadership turns to us and says, well, this works, and you can see the blood drain from our marketers, and Congress of Ravens flies out of a trees. So, um, we're, because trying to understand what works gets you to the point of, well, this works, which means this doesn't work. And then they say, why? So now you're starting to crack it open. And I think it was alluded earlier, rooms get smaller when you start to find waste, mm. um, because not always the recommendations of investment into what is working follow the short-term cuts. So it's, it's definitely uh, increasingly a, a large part of my workflow. and. It, to the great detriment of the popularity of my team. <laughs> David, how about from the media side? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, in the fall, in the late fall, we had a number of uh, dinners with um, all of the major agencies, and I think the dialogue that not only took place within the, the dinners, but uh, after that um, really ramped up. Uh, attribution was one of the most important questions that kept coming up, and uh, it's been in the news a lot. I mean. Certainly advertisers and agencies, they've always been interested in what's working. Uh, we just had different definitions of what that is. And I think you point out a, a good uh, point that there's so many different people that are doing attribution now that it's getting to be bewildering. Um, it's almost like engagement. It is. <laughs> it, it is, and I think that certainly it's, it's getting hard to tell exactly how people are doing what they're doing, um, and it's, it's something that there's many questions about it, but there's certainly a lot of interest in dialogue, and I think you're seeing a lot of traction as well. You're seeing people that are moving towards just talking about it to actually doing something about it. I think it is like engagement a lot in that I don't think there's a single definition in the minds of all the people who have to use the term. And so, you know, for our clients who want to know what we mean when we say it, to the media companies, and we want to know what they mean when they say it, to the researchers, and they all mean something different as we've, as we've found out. I think that's a key point. I mean, our clients have been saying to us, in what respect is attribution different from mixed modeling? In what respect is it different from optimization? In what respect is it different from you know, any other kind of research we may be doing and what are we gonna do with it after we have it? Our clients have been in and out of attribution solutions over the last five years. They've tried this one for a year and dropped it and then this one for a year and dropped it and then taken it in-house for a year and then killed that and then tried, you know, they've been all over the place and I, I don't really blame them. They've gotten so many messages from uh, all over the industry about what they must be doing today, so. Whoever invented consultative selling or selling like deserves a, a trial at The Hague because <laughs> everyone wants to be helpful. Everybody comes in and says, you tell us what your problem is, and of course we've got a thing in the box for that. So <laughs> reports like this are, are helpful, but if you're dealing with a company like ours where we've got a lot of data, it's very, very sensitive. Um, making that fluid and getting it out there and the procurement process of any big company, let alone an insurer, I can't afford to take everyone down the field. I gotta you know, pick my prom date and focus in, and so if, if this, things like this help level the playing field and, and say, hey, you don't have to be great at everything. We can talk about something else. I just need to know what you, you are good at. You really do. Um, and, it's, and it's somewhat objective as best you can. It, it, it makes our life a lot easier. Yeah. 
Alice, do you want to say anything about how the guide might help some of these issues? Or not? Um, <laughs> you know, the reason we wrote the glossary is because if you want to find out how people are doing the attribution, you're going to run into words that are this long, that are, you know, these statistical techniques that even Jim, as his PhD of econ economics, didn't, didn't know what these techniques were. Some of them are that new. Some of them are new. Some of them are just different words for the exact same thing. <laughs> and um, there is a lot, I, there's no deliberate obfuscation in the industry, but there is a lot of, you know, this is really proprietary. And we call it the blah, 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 blah. And then you, you turn the next page, and the exact same thing is being called something completely different. So, um, so we made the guide to uh, begin to attempt to kind of set some level playing fields, set the most important uh, evaluative criteria for people, and, and begin to sort of provide some of the, um, the framing of these important questions. Yeah. Yeah, Claire, you, you, you raised a really interesting point when you said you've had clients who've been in and out of attribution. We, Multiple. We've certainly heard that a providers. lot in our, in our consulting the last a couple of years. And in fact, last year at, at our attribution accelerator, that's a plug, um, John Lehman, uh, former CMO, said CMOs, the C-suite, is terrified of attribution. You know, for for that reason, but uh, but maybe a little more measured comment was one that that we like that we're you know we're on a journey here. You know, it's, we don't have a solution. We didn't wake up one day and say, hey, you know, we need attribution to be cross channel and, and have the whole mix, and let's just make it happen. You know, it's been said that we're in year two of a five year journey. Of course, I think I've been saying that for about a year now, so I don't want to be in year two forever. But let's maybe <laughs> be in three. How do you think uh, people such as yourselves should proceed on, on this journey? What, what's a sensible way to get to the end game? Uh, uh, you go first. The, the um, <laughs> full stop before you do anything else. Summon the four horsemen, legal, privacy, security, compliance. Tell them exactly what you want to do. Yeah. Um, do not do anything before passing that go, because yeah. I see so many projects get three weeks out of launch after so many months and hundreds of thousands of dollars spent on a POC, and the attorney's like, who are you? What's a cookie? What are you trying to do? So um, call them before you start breakfast. Tell them about the weird dream you had. Be friends with them. Make sure they are, you overshare with them so they're just happy to tell you yes to go away. Um, <laughs> then, then the next thing, which I've, I've learned the hard way, and, and I really wish we all could collectively be more honest with it, um, do a objective audit of people's KPIs. Mm. I spend so much of my professional life reverse engineering people's bonus structure to try <laughs> to understand why they act the way they act. Um, and if we had all just sat down at the beginning when leadership says, all right, profitable growth, <clears throat> and one team says, oh, you mean you want me to grow revenue and then turn off all my marketing and then grow profits? Or um, you know, even though it's at a negative ROI, and another team's like, oh, you want every dollar we spend to be profitable. You get eight months down the road, and you all hate each other, and you're staring across it, and you try to go out and have a summit over beers, and you realize is that someone had already hit their top line revenue target for the year. And so to turn off any marketing, even if it's an efficiency, is going to make, you know, they're not going to be able to put that down payment on the pool in the backyard. So um, I wish we were all a lot more honest with it, and do it sensitively, bring in HR or whatever, and just be like, let's talk about what our goal is, and are we all aligned from an incentive structure, both internally and, and externally? A lot of these partners, if they tie any buying to their attribution services, keep in mind there might be incentives relative to how they're compensated and their margins mm. that will weight things in particular orders. It's, it's kind of like attribution modeling is like a, a cheap Christmas tree that you can turn it one direction to get it to look pretty good, but you walk anywhere else around it and it's bare. Mm. I like that analogy, I'm gonna take that back. Uh, from the agency, when the clients call us and say, do you have opinions about attribution research? We say, yes, and who are you and what's your goal? So, I mean, it really follows on very nicely from what you just said, I appreciate that. Um, I think from our perspective, we have, you know, our clients are, some of them are big and some of them are small and some of them are regional and some of them are national and, and, and their situations are all distinctive, right? And their research history is also distinctive. They've all been on paths of various kinds over the past decades, trying to understand their businesses and how they need to innovate and how they can operate you know, most effectively and most efficiently. So that all, you know, when we give an opinion on attribution research for you, this particular client, and we don't sell a solution of our own at RPA, we just, you know, use third parties. Um, 
it's, it's about who they are, and we try to make that a responsible education. It is an education. This is, a, a, as I said at the beginning, a relatively new topic for a lot of our clients still coming out of traditional research. Um, so I think you know, what you just said is, is right on. I would encourage anyone here who works with marketers who need education to consider their agency as one of their hopefully impartial experts because we do see a, a lot of experiments that you know, go this way or that way. Um, and we can bring perspective, especially when we don't have an ax to grind, and that's not a, that's not a dig at anybody. So. Can I just under two tactical considerations? Sure. So assuming you got everybody aligned incentives and you know, the, the apocalypse won't come from legal, um, <clears throat> disaggregate all of your data as to the lowest level as you can. Um, you would be surprised. Um, I'm a former Nielsen person, and not all data sets are, are made equal. And once you get down there, before you start talking about pulling levers or saying, is this working, that working, get it all on the table, do proper lift studies, mm -hmm. just to figure out where the problems really might be, and crack one of those eggs at a time. Because if you try to pull the whole thing to, apart at the same time, it's gonna be wet spaghetti. Yeah. You're gonna, you're, you're, it'll be too much moving around, and you're like, <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm wasting so much money on paid search, and you know, it's gotta go over here and over there, and, and you're just not gonna get anywhere. So just understand what, where your money's going, before you start to say, is it, is it creating value? Should I change my model and everything like that? Because too many people start data projects without table setting, and it's, it's like a small cramped mm. kitchen. You're not gonna be serving more than one or two people if you don't mise en place everything you need, even though it might take 80% of the time of investment to actually do a data project. And I think uh, it's important that if, if you don't have experience, that, that you really have to get in the game right now because one of the things, and I think you saw this in the uh, development of the document, uh, this, is, this area is moving ahead quickly. Yes. Everything's moving uh, fast forward, and even things uh, that weren't possible two years ago now are very much a uh, coin of the realm. So I think you, you have to really understand what your objectives are and then align the measurement task around that and, and work with partners. And I think the guide can really form kind of that first step. Uh, what are our objectives and what, what can we do to isolate the partners that are most likely to work with us? Um, so I think that you've done a great service putting this guide together. Uh, but hopefully it, it's just the first step. Hopefully there'll be new versions coming out that really get into a deeper dive. But certainly you've framed what the arguments are, what, what the questions you should ask and what really uh, is important to the advertiser, the agency, or the media company is where, where are my priorities and what do I have to do and I, I need to align with, with those priorities as, as you do a project. Right. My only problem, and, and I, I have to be careful about this, but my only problem with the whole notion of attribution and being on a two or five year journey <coughs> is that it just, if it didn't matter so much to all the people in this room, uh, whether you get the attribution right or not, it would be okay. So an experiment is okay. You know, going on a journey where you, you don't really, um, you know, the, the stakes aren't as high as they are here. But in attribution and ROI measurement, the stakes are really high. If you don't perform, you're gone, and it's very difficult to get back on somebody's list, right? So all of this experimentation and all of the sort of vagaries of the way these um, uh, studies are done, um, it's almost like you, you can experiment, but then you have to apply the data so carefully because it makes such a radical difference right. to the livelihoods of everyone in, the, in this room. Well, and it, that's a good point, and I think, what did you say, there's 27 companies that you outlined that? I should know uh, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm sure if you gave them all the same project to do that, they'd come up with at least 26 different. We want to do that, that study. <laughs> we want to do that study. That would be really enlightening. Uh, and, and I don't think that it's because one would be right and one would be wrong. They'd all be different. Well, they all have all different points of view right. and yeah. there's different lenses that everybody. Absolutely, uh, right. absolutely. Yeah. And we're gonna have to figure out which of those lenses we really value. That might be something each client has to do for themselves. Yours might be different than American Honda's, which we work with. But I, I expect there's gonna be some consolidation in this space. 27 is too many. You know, we've already seen that this year with Nielsen acquiring Visual IQ and a few other things like that. There's gonna be more of that, I think, which I think is good because the more they can be strong and stable and invest in themselves, I think that'll be a benefit to the industry. They can produce better research. Maybe you won't get such different results if you 
send the things yeah, out to yeah. multiple. Well, it, our, the clock's winding down a bit here, and I, I, I want to focus on one thing. It's one p bit of value for everyone out in the audience today. So they have the provider guide now. They have this kind of look at the lay of the land of the, of the providers. And most of the, we, we're missing uh, three that I really wished were in there, but you know it doesn't always work out. Um, so we've got that, but you come to the guide with a question. Right. So, from your experience, what would you say if you were to pick one thing, you know, in, in, in choosing a provider for your attribution work? What's the first thing, or if not the one thing, that you would uh, look for in the guide, and then and then go deeper in conversation with the with the providers? So, I, I, uh, do you want to? Okay. Um, well, I think from our perspective, certainly being um, while we have many different touch points, television is a big part of what we do. Uh, we want to make sure that the approach is going to really fairly value television's effectiveness. There's been many, many types of attribution that uh, tend to kind of collapse all the responsibilities, maybe that last click or the last touch, uh, kind of um, so totally ignoring everything that's been done up into that point in time. So we're really looking for the approach that's go going to really fairly evaluate. Um, our programs and our programming, our, our adver advertising. So that's of paramount importance to us. And we also look for an approach that is open, transparent, and, and really can be uh, something that uh, our, our clients uh, that will have faith in that that's an approach that uh, holds water. Great, great. Claire, do we? Uh, I would say uh, the thing that, that, that we would focus on, the question we would focus on is, is what are we able to do ourselves, and by us I mean our client. If we, have a, if we have a client investigating attribution research, the question we would ask them to address for real, solidly, is what are you actually able to do yourself for yourself, and what do you need to give to an outside provider to do? Some companies have more better access to their own data than others. Some companies are more analytical than others. Some can do some help. Some can help themselves more than others. And when that's possible, I think it's a benefit to the company because they feel more ownership. There's maybe more understanding of with those four horsemen. I think that's a good thing. That would be the the question related to that is is what transparency will I have into what you're doing and how? Because if I can't verify it. I can't trust it, and if I can't trust it, I can't invest in it. And the simple truth is when leadership asks me what works, they're really asking me what's true. Mm -hmm. And every one of them has a different truth that they may want to hear, whether they're in direct or brand or they're the television buyers or whatever. If I can't get in there and spot check the data, run the model in a few different ways, turn the Christmas tree a few different ways, I can't invest in it, I can't put my name on it, because I won't be able to answer the fundamental question is, right. what works? Um, now that's not to say that we would bring everything into house. We're a small team, way too big globally, and if I have to spend my career doing attribution, my brain will melt. Um, <laughs> so I'm more than happy to pay fairly for someone to do it, but I need to be able to trust and verify. And too many of these people say, well, that's proprietary. Yeah. But then when I crack it open, it's the same dang algorithm. The math has been around for 100 years. So I, I get it. I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to ruin your business. I'm just, I need to be able to understand what you're doing with my money. Right, right. Alice, what would you say? I, I, I wasn't even thinking about this question. Um, I was thinking about that Christmas tree. <laughs> um, <coughs> what's the first thing you should look for? I, maybe possibly experience in the category. Uh, because a lot of these categories are so specific that um, if someone has done something for one of my competitors, that's great. But if they have experience in the category, I'd be interested in, in knowing that and how it all turned out. Uh, I, I'm not sure the clients have a level of sophistication to bring these things in-house. I, I really think we're seeing this big, huge bifurcation of, of, of skills and experience and everything that it, they're, those attribution and, uh, and the analytics people are on their own island, uh, maybe for a reason. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, it wouldn't make financial sense for us to even have, I mean, and we're a small team. You know, we're only a dozen globally, and we're busy, and we're training away work. What will happen, though, is we have some programs that we have taken in-house primarily because the data was too sensitive that I don't even like that person riding the subway, yeah. right? I, don't, I am so terrified about what would happen if that person walked out the door or, or something ill came of them because there's way too much revenue tied 
to there. So there's a, there's a ironic for an insurance company. There's a huge amount of risk sitting on the shoulders of very few people. Um, so we treat them well, um, but it's you know not the sexiest of industries. So there are data security insurance policies. <laughs> <laughs> we have we I've have, we have key man policies, but yeah, no, it's I mean right. that is that is always a trade off. Is ideally we're only we're only taking it in house long enough to understand it, so we can stand it up you know, more at scale, right? Because right? we just can't be everywhere and, right. and we don't want the dependencies. Right, cool, great. Well, our little red light is flashing. So I want to thank the panel, please join me. And our speaker. Thanks you guys so much. Um, and thanks to Jim and Alice for uh, conducting this, you know, important study and all the work they put into making the booklet. Um, and I'd also like to thank, uh, I don't know if they're here, Terry Cohen and Lewis Jones from the 4As. Um, if you want to raise your hand. They were terrific in helping to um, make this happen, and they really contributed a lot. There's Terry in the back. They have their big data summit next week, so that's a plug. Um, now, continuing this attribution theme, I'm actually delighted to welcome back um, Cindy Davis of Disney ABC Television Group and Craig McDonald of Accenture. And they're following up on a study they presented at last year's summit on the next phase of their research on multi-platform TV attribution. So take it away. You're quickly directed. Great. That looks like the last slide, unless you doubled it up. That's the last one. That looks like the last slide. While they're doing that, good afternoon. Um, we're, Craig and I are excited to be back here, um, share a little bit with you about a second phase of work that we've done around attribution, which seems to be the topic du jour, which we're excited about. Um, for those of you, show of hands, how many people were here for the SIM meeting last year? Okay. Um, the, if you were, then you heard us talk about the first phase of work that we did from an attribution standpoint together, which really focused on the impact of multi-platform television on ROI. And since everybody didn't raise their hand, um, we thought a good way to start, the very first thing, would be to give you, have Craig give you a quick recap of what that work entailed and how we did it and the major key finding that came out of it. And that'll sort of create a foundation for what we're gonna talk about for the rest of the time today. Yeah, and I'll go through this briefly because again, many of you were here a year ago. The reason Accenture did this study is because, like the previous presentation, we do a lot of media mix modeling uh, on a global basis. But here in the United States, we have a data sample where in the case of this study, we use 2013 to 2015 media analytics from our clients, we tracked in that study about $15 billion worth of media spend on an annualized basis. And what's most important though is when we do econometrics modeling, we get the sales that are generated from that media money so we could do the analytic study. What we were trying to do in this study was look at channel level attribution performance and figure out, well, what's the relative value of each of those individual channels, out of home, radio, obviously TV, obviously um, digital in driving sales. A couple of the key things we were trying to accomplish in a couple of our key findings. One, we changed the definition of how we define TV into this concept called multi-platform TV because we were trying to pick up the concept of TV viewability and the advertisement that's embedded within TV viewability for premium long form video shown on any platform versus short form video. Think the cat, you know, the pre-roll that's on the cat video on YouTube, et cetera, et cetera, right? A couple of the key findings that we found. One was that um, from a pure attribution standpoint, what we were doing is comparing the absolute performance of a channel to its marginal performance as a channel, trying to get that attribution concept. And the highlight was that when we looked at multi-platform TV ROI, it was essentially undercounted by about 10% in the analysis that we were doing, and digital was overcounted by 18%. There's a couple of quick ramifications that I just want to mention of that. Looking at that, we saw that, frankly, digital was oversubscribed by about 5 to 7%, depending on the vertical, in our, in our survey largely because of this problem. This mis ability to use marginal attribution as a way to measure the actual performance or attributed performance of a channel. And the best way to make, for example, search perform better was there was a bunch of collinearity between search and um, TV. As TV spend went up, search value went up. And those things work very much in concert with each other. The last point I'll make is that 
we, we, I think we teased out a concept, which is that not all impressions are created equal. The content itself or the rich media format of TV has an actual long-lasting uh, impact. In the case of our study, because we, we had a, a three-year sample, we were able to see that the value of a TV ad, only about 50% of a quarter's, a quarter's worth of spending on TV was recognized within the first 12 months. The other 50% was in the subsequent 24 months versus most of the digital channels we looked at where almost all the value was subsumed within the quarter in which the expenditures are made. Great. So we got a lot of good learnings um, to summarize that entire study in one slide and what Craig just said um, is hard, but we had a lot of good learnings, but we still had questions, right? So armed with those learnings, we commissioned Accenture to do another very robust piece of work. Um, in fact, probably even more robust than the first, right, Craig? Yeah. We nearly doubled the amount of marketing spend we were looking at. We looked at $25 billion in um, media spend across 26 clients, across six different industries. And as Craig said, similar to what we did in the first phase of the study, we were able to, um, to have, in addition to that, three years of actual sales results, right, to connect. Um, we looked at a host of different variables, right, because what we were trying to do here was identify really what the key drivers of multi-platform television ROI were, right? The first phase talked about the impact of multi-platform TV from an ROI standpoint. This was really digging in to try to find out what those key drivers were. So we looked at a host of different variables. We looked, of course, at things um, like Nielsen ratings. We also looked um, with Nielsen social at social metrics, and we um, used a lot of good information from MAGID to look at content engagement and intentionality and attention, and so a, a host of variables that we were able to take a look at. And again, that goal was really be able to identify the things about the content that contribute most to what our advertisers are trying to drive, which is sales. So what I'd love to do now is let um, Accenture do what they do best, right, and tell you about the key findings that they had. But let me just quickly frame those for you um, into three areas. When we, f when we had finished all of the work and identified the three big drivers, they were audience size, consumers' commitment to content, which we'll talk to you a little bit about, and consumers' perception um, and evaluation of that content, not our perception, consumers' perceptions of the content. So Craig, I'll turn it over to you. Sure, so there's a fundamental assumption that actually Joe had mentioned this before in the panel two ago, which is that you know attention leads to attribution. I mean, that's the fundamental thing we we're trying to test here. And as Cindy said, we took three years worth of programming schedules, every single program for 26 different advertisers, and we saw every single show that they were advertising in, right? And we knew what the ratings were on those shows, and we knew what the amount that was spent on those shows. We looked across all networks, so this wasn't just Disney, ABC, this was across all networks, right? And so the first thing that I want to, let me grab that sure. quick. First thing I want to talk about is that because we had such topography in the data, like Cindy said, we were trying to test a couple of key things. The first thing we looked at was audience size. So. Looking across rating, right, we, we basically were able to compare, was the rating increases on a show, what happens to the cost of getting that rating point? Joe talked about this as well, he's talking about the increased cost per rating, and then what happens to the ROI, because that's actually the thing that the advertisers are ultimately trying to drive. And the theory is, is that as the rating goes up, there's a almost, um, I would say, social impact of the communities that develop around the shows. You can see here in the, in the graphic, the cost multiple goes for the lowest rated programs from 0.4 up to 0.12. So basically, a high rated, high rated show is about three times the expense of a low rated show. We just, we just put everything in big buckets just to kind of like take out the noise and get to the key findings. But the ROI is almost seven to eight percent, eight X what the, uh, uh, on a high rated show than on a low rated show. Our th we didn't get deeply into the causality of this, but I'll get into some of the indicators that we had in a second, but the theory is that a high rated show is just creating a conversation in the society. It's creating a cultural event that feeds on itself and actually allows the advertisers that are embedded within those shows to benefit from that, I guess, uh, that, that, that uh, social gestalt. Now, digging into that a little bit, we also um, layered in some other data points. I'll start on the right-hand side, right? So again, we looked at a series of different shows and we normalized all the shows for rate, uh, um, yeah, for rating basically, right? And then we looked at the engagement from using no, uh, Nielsen social media data, which is essentially what's the Twitter activity within a two-hour window of the, sh of the airing of the show, and then compared that to the ROI. So 
two sh think about two different shows. One has a very high rating, one has a very low rating. We normalized the rating out of that though. And then what we were able to see was one that had a high social media engagement, what happened to the ROI? Well, it was about 2x what a show that has a low social media engagement has. So social media engagement on the show itself has a big impact on the ability of that show to deliver ROI for the advertisers that are embedded with, within those shows. Then Magid also, or Magid also had a, um, had a survey that we layered on top of the program level information, which looks at each of the programs and says, do consumers say that they have the intention to continue to invest their time in that show as well? What's the ramification of that for the advertisers? Again, on this particular survey, a show that showed high intentionality was delivering a 2x ROI for the advertisers embedded in that show versus one that had a low intentionality. This last area though I think is the most, uh, most um, fascinating. Um, Maggot also does a survey which is essentially a indicator of the engagement that the consumers have with the content itself on a whole series of different factors. They call it emotional DNA. There's seven or eight factors, is it? Is eight. It? Eight, eight, eight factors. Right, Mike. Um, but there's eight different factors in there. And what we did is we looked at each of the shows and said, well, what's the variability in the ROI based off of how the consumers that are evaluating the content of the show on each of these eight different dimensions? And do those dimensions then drive differential ROI? And this is really a commentary on if consumers are engaging with various emotional aspects of a show, do they then engage in a different way with the advertisements that are shown on that show? And then do they buy the goods? And does that show up as ROI for the advertiser? And we saw it in Technicolor. I mean, there was a tremendous amount of variability in this data. I will give you a couple of examples, though, just at the highest level. Shows that had a high emotional DNA from the MAGID study were delivering a 1.7x ROI over those that had a low engagement from the standpoint of the, uh, of the, um, of the survey itself. Um, Cindy's going to talk a little bit more detail, though, about how this got translated out into some of the key dimensions mm -hmm. themselves. Sure. Thanks. Um, this last area is one that we found particularly interesting. And it's, as Craig said, um, and we used the MAGID eDNA, sort of emotional DNA index here. And if you aren't familiar with that, um, Mike, raise your hand, right? From, right, um, no, no, a shout out to you. You can buy me a drink later. But the, <laughs> if you're not familiar about it, I'm sure he'll be around to, to share it with you a little bit. But we found it really interesting. And it's at its core, right? What we're showing here and what we're seeing here is that shows that have a stronger emotional signature deliver stronger ROI, right? Where that, we saw that direct connection between how customers feel about our shows, right? And the benefits that are attributed to the advertiser in terms of increased sales. There's three dimensions in particular out of the eight where we saw significant um, correlation. Um, smarts, edge, and relatability, again, Mike can provide you details on what exactly those four, those three of the eight dimensions mean, but anywhere from two and a half to 4.2x in terms of higher ROI. So we're spending a lot of time digging into this area. I think you heard it in several of the panelists talking about this emotional connection, this experience, this, this way to make a connection with our customers. And now we believe we have a very strong, very strong evidence that well, what we've all believed, I think, for a very long time is in fact proven out in the um, benefits from an ROI standpoint that can be earned by the advertiser that participates in that content. So a lot more work to do here, but we're super interested in, the, in digging in deeper because the findings we feel are very compelling. We've just started talking to our advertisers about um, about the study, so it's fresh, um, and we're having some really good conversations. If you would like to know more about either the first um, study that we conducted last year that spoke to the benefits of multi-platform television, or this one, um, first place to go is um, abcallaccess.com, our website. Um, there's video and infographics there for you. Um, and if you're interested in seeing the full study, just feel free to reach out to me, cindy.davis at disney.com. Um, and we'll make arrangements for someone to take you through the full study. Um, we're really encouraged about, to, to what all of our panelists were talking about, um, the opportunity to really show um, what every advertiser is challenged 
challenged you know, to, um, to really stand up and defend, which is did that advertising in that show work and it del deliver ROI? I will tell you the truth, I had a little bit of a freak out deja vu moment when Lou was talking about being in that boardroom with the CFO, right, and seeing money move, right, from advertising to another area of the company. I have been there multiple times in my career and had um, what I can only call an attribution envy, right, to other parts of the company who could directly show, right, that what they were doing was work and delivering financial benefit and delivering on KPIs for the company. So just to start, just scratching the surface. Um, let us know if you want to know more. Um, we appreciate the time, and thanks very much if you will help me thanking our partners from Accenture.